Okay, good morning, guys. Um, I hope everyone is having a fantastic day today. We're going to talk about um, our wild horticulture program today, and specifically, we're going to cover invasive plants in your landscape. My name is Maxine Hunter. I'm the Marion County Residential Horticulture Agent, and um, we deal with a lot of invasive plants here in Marion County, and so we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the common ones that we see and what you can do if you have these plants in your area or even in your backyard. So first, what do we mean by invasive? Um, we get this question a lot. And so one thing to remember is even if it's aggressive, that doesn't necessarily mean it is invasive. Invasive species specifically have been found to alter native habitats and have a negative impact on species and ecosystems. Um, not all non-native species are considered to be invasive, so you don't have to plant all natives, but definitely try to stay away from invasive species. Um, and just to reiterate that, you cannot have a native plant that is invasive. So even if it's aggressive, that does not mean that it is necessarily invasive at all. So, um, and we'll talk again about this at the end, but resources that you can use to figure out if something is invasive or not is our UF IFAS assessment list. Um, and you can find that at ifis.ufl.assessment.edu. Um, that link is at the end as well. So don't worry if you didn't catch that. Also, we have our FLEPSI list, which is the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. And the link for that is at the bottom of this presentation as well. So um, on top of invasives, we have a couple different categories of invasives. So in FLEPSI, we use a category one and a category two invasive. The category ones are the uh, most problematic. And on top of that, we have what is called a noxious weed or prohibited plant. And that is monitored by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry. So these plants may not be sold in Florida and under no circumstances will these species be permitted to be in possession um, as far as collection, transportation, cultivation, or importation. Um, this is really important because we get this question a lot. Why are invasive plant species allowed to be um, sold at certain stores such as our box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace Hardware, wherever that might be. And the fact is, um, Oftentimes these distribution facilities will order on a regional basis. And so a plant that may not be invasive in Georgia or South Carolina may be ordered for the entire Southern region. And if it's not on the noxious weed list, they are still permitted to carry that. The other thing to note, and we'll talk more about this as we speak about individual species, but um, just because there's a species of plant that is listed as invasive doesn't mean that they have not come up with um, sterile varieties of that plant at this point. We've made a lot of progress over the last five to 10 years in coming up with some sterile cultivars of plants such as uh, Mexican petunia, um, lantana, uh, nandina, and we'll talk about all of those as we go. So again, when you're looking at some of these lists, there are multiple different places that keep lists of invasive species, and they will vary slightly between organizations. Um, but we're looking here at what we have as a FLEPSI list, which is again, the Florida um, Exotic Pest Council, um, Exotic Pest Plant Council, and they have 67 category one invasive species listed. These are altering native plant communities by disrupting and displacing native species, changing community structures and ecological functions, and possibly even hybridizing with some native plants. So that's pretty bad. Um, FLEPSI also has 69 species listed as category two um, invasives, and these are increasing in abundance and frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities. So, um, the category ones are the ones we're really concerned about trying to make sure that we don't have them in our landscapes. So to start talking about some of these, we'll start out with some noxious weeds. Again, these are not permitted in any situation um, as far as sale, importation, or transportation. And often these are very popular and we'll see them frequently in our neighborhoods. One, because they've been brought in for a reason many, many years ago, and then they spread rapidly. So they're very difficult to get rid of. Um, 
and two people move in and don't know what their identification is. So um, to start with, we'll talk about the Chinese tallow tree, which is also called the popcorn tree. Um, this was imported in China, um, from China in the 1700s as a seed oil crop. Um, it's very popular. It grows very well in wet areas and well-drained uplands. Um, so various ecosystems support this tree. It's not super picky. Um, it grows very rapidly and the seeds are spread by birds, um, including woodpeckers and also by water. They will float. So if you get heavy rains and they make it into our water systems or if you're near a creek or other water basin, they're happy to stay in that water until they find a location to get established. So um, this particular plant does release toxins that alter the soil chemistry and prevent the reestablishment of native species. So that makes it even more dangerous to have in the ecosystem. Here's a couple pictures of Chinese tallow trees. You can see it's got a very distinct leaf on it. Um, you can see those popcorn shape starting to form and the berries on the leaves. And the picture on the left is more of a fall picture um, where the leaves have started to turn red. Um, and our next picture here, you can see again, um, berries on the leaves still, those will fall off and every single one of those seeds is likely to germinate. They have very high germination rates. Um, and this is a uh, deciduous tree that does lose all of its leaves in the winter. Um, be careful buying Christmas wreaths online. Um, oftentimes tallow wreaths will come with berries attached. These berries are viable. So um, these are often available for purchase online and people don't understand that it's illegal to send them to Florida um, because these trees are so invasive here. Um, unfortunately, they do make beautiful wreaths, but um, we don't want to spread this plant any further than we can um, prevent. So be very cautious in this, and we'll talk about this as well with the uh, Brazilian pepper plant. Our next tree is the camphor tree. So this is one of my arch nemesis. I see this all the time. Um, although the leaves do smell really good, if you're ever having trouble identifying a camphor tree, you can crack one of the leaves and you can see it has a very distinct almost like a pepperminty type smell. So um, it's been a source of essential oils from the Far East for hundreds of years, um, but it's been made artificially since the 1920s. So these trees are no longer utilized um, for most of the essential oils. Um, again, the seeds are spread by birds and it is a class one invader. It has very brittle wood and narrow crotches between the branches. So this tree is particularly dangerous in backyard situations because we do get hurricane seasons every year and we've been having some other winter storms with high winds as well and these are a big fall hazard. Um, there has been an eradication underway in certain parts of the Ocala National Forest for a number of years now. So um, this tree does get rather large. It's got a fairly smooth bark on it um, and again like most of our invasives it spreads rapidly and grows rapidly. So here's a picture of the leaf arrangement on the camphor tree. Um, this tree can get to be 50 to 100 foot tall. There are no serious predators outside of its native range. And unfortunately, every now and then, um, we still see it being sold in nurseries. So we would really like to stop that if possible, if there's small nurseries we can work with. Um, I haven't particularly seen this, but I know some of my colleagues have. Um, homeowners need to join in and helping control this particular tree because this is one generally when we see it in a neighborhood we'll see it in the majority of backyards and sometimes in multiples three four five trees in a yard um, so unfortunately this is a very bad tree to have in your landscape here's an example of the camper tree invasion and just like I mentioned in the previous slide Oftentimes when we see it in people's landscapes or backyards, you'll see multiple trees. So if you see all of the pink tags in this particular photo, there's one, two, looks like about at least eight camphor trees in this one shot here. So again, they spread rapidly and they'll come up anywhere that they can find enough ground to sprout and they'll push out everything else around it. Next, we have our Brazilian pepper plant. This is another noxious weed. Um, it is related to poison ivy, and although we want people to control it, we do want you to take caution um, in cutting it down because if you do have a reaction to it, it can be very irritating to your respiratory system, your eyes, your skin, all of the above. So um, do realize that this plant can cause irritation. 
Um, it is salt tolerant. It displaces many coastal plants and can be very difficult to control. Um, another unfortunate issue for us here in Florida is most of our Florida ecosystems really like fire and fire can help control specific um, um, specific invasive species, but this particular invasive happens to resist the fires and other control methods. So um, fire in the ecosystem does not help with this particular plant. Um, it has been found as far nor north as Fernandina Beach and we do see it in many of our public um, parks and areas. Here's some pictures of the Brazilian pepper. You can see the bright red berries on it. It's very beautiful. But um, again, it can irritate skin. It does have toxins in it. Um, and it's very rapidly growing, extremely invasive. Uh, the Brazilian pepper specifically can form dense monospecific stands. Um, we have found that fewer birds nest in pepper forest, and in some cases, fewer amphibians, fewer reptiles, um, and fewer species altogether were found in these areas that had been invaded by the Brazilian pepper. Like I mentioned before, much like the Chinese tallow tree, the Brazilian peppers can be used on um, Christmas wreaths. They can also be used as decorative pink peppercorns and even sold in mixed peppercorn spice grinders. So um, you've got to take caution and read labels to make sure that you don't get these red berries for a purpose that you may not want them for and certainly make sure they don't get into your landscape. Our next species is the Australian pine. Um, this colonizes, colonizes quickly. It disrupts um, beach plant communities. Um, it is very, very common in South Florida. The invasions produce a very dense litter that decreases small mammal population densities and prevents other plants from growing up into it. Um, it also affects the nesting efforts of sea turtles and American crocodiles in South Florida. So Australian pines are prohibited. They are definitely not a true pine tree. They have been found as far north as uh, Cedar Key in St. Augustine. They can grow over 100 feet tall. They are very salt tolerant. They often grow as a monoculture. Nothing else usually grows in these stands with them. And um, again, they disrupt native vegetation, um, including beach dunes and our native animal species. So another picture of the Australian pines up close. This is a picture off of a golf course. Our next noxious weed is the air potato. Um, this has been very frequent. We have had some success in getting this eradicated, but it's still plenty of it around to be removed. It was cultured in West Africa as a food plant, and then it was introduced to Florida as an ornamental in 1905. So this has been around for 115 years now. Um, it takes over tree canopies, quickly growing to be 60 to 70 foot long vines. It has both aerial tubers and underground tubers, which make it extremely difficult to control. And if you remove the underground tubers and there's any piece of it left, it will restart. So very difficult to control air potatoes in general. Here's a great picture of the air potato. You can see that dark green heart-shaped leaf. This covers mature trees and shades out any understory vegetation. And so it basically makes a big mass canopy over the entire understory and um, suffocates any plants that were growing there. Um, it has not had the impact on wildlife studied well um, but what we do have is in this top right corner here, you can see the picture of our air potato beetle. This is a biological control agent that has been very successful in eradicating this. And um, our site here at the Marion County Extension Office also works with the Florida Department of Agriculture to um, disperse this beetle to residents. So if you have problems with air potatoes in your area, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you get on the list for the Florida Department of Ag's next um, distribution of these beetles they can really help with the problem. We also recommend if you do have the bulbs in your yard to collect them and bag them and throw them away. Don't compost them or put them on other property. Make sure they're double bagged. Um, pretty much anytime we have invasive species, we do recommend double bagging them and putting them in the dumpster. All right, our next noxious weed is the Japanese climbing fern. Um, much like the air potato, this climbs over the top of trees, killing them by suffocating them out. Um, this is an extremely nasty little fern. 
um, that will grow with any of the pieces left behind. All right, one aquatic species we'll talk about is water hyacinth. We've got a lot of beautiful natural resources here in Marion County that involve the water, including the Rainbow River, the Okawaha River, the Silver River, and many of our spring systems. Um, water hyacinth is a prohibited species. I have seen it sold in some stores, um, slightly different species than this, but it's still called the common name water hyacinth for ponds, um, like small private ponds and aquaria. And uh, it's not something that we recommend because if any piece of this gets out, much like um, the Japanese climbing firm, it will reproduce from very small fragments of the plant. Um, it was introduced from South America in the 1880s. It can double its population in as little as 12 days. And the problem with it here in Marion County and across the state of Florida and our natural resources is we um, highly rely on our boat traffic and aquatic industries um, for some of our tourism and also for our hobbies and activities on the weekends. And this can block boat traffic as well as reduce light and oxygen levels in the water, which kills our fish, reduces biodiversity and displaces native plants, um, including our aquatic grasses, which feed our manatees and other animals. Um, there is currently a maintenance control plan here in Florida that uh, runs through the Florida Department of um, Wildlife and Conservation Commission, so FWC, and the control methods include herbicides, machines, and biocontrol insects. Um, most people prefer to see the machines and biocontrol insects used, but they're often, because this plant reproduces so fast, they're just not quick enough to keep up with it, so it is necessary to spray herbicides, and occasionally that does upset people. Here's some pictures of the water hyacinth. It does have a beautiful purple flower, but you can see how dense this is and it doesn't allow anything else to grow and is very, very catastrophic for our young fish populations um, and other water um, species. All right, next we have coral ardesia. This is a native from Japan and India. It was introduced as an ornamental plant around 1900. The seeds are dispersed by birds. It reaches densities of greater than 100 plants per meter squared, so there's really nothing else that can fit in there, and it does shade out any native seedlings. Here's some pictures of um, coral ardesia, and in this bottom picture you can really see how dense that is in there. The only other thing that's growing is a little bit of fern and some small trees that were likely already established. It has a beautiful red berry, much like the Brazilian pepper, but every single one of those berries will germinate and um, likely spread to cause much um, complication in getting it removed. All right, our next species is Lantana camara. Um, Lantana is one of the few that has a native relative or native species um, in the same family here in Florida. That is Lantana depressa and it has a solid pale yellow flower, and this is actually endangered. Um, Lantana camaro, unlike Lantana depressa, is native to the Caribbean, and it is said to have some medicinal uses, but um, I've never really been clear on exactly what those were used for. Um, the unripe fruit is poisonous. This is one that is listed on um, ASPCA's website as toxic to many of our pets and children. The roots and shoots produce a chemical that can reduce growth to nearby plants. So again, this is one we don't want in our landscape. I will say though, in the defense of Lantana Kumar, this is one that we have spent a lot of time and research getting sterile varieties. So don't panic when you see this in the box stores. These are new varieties that are out. There's multiple varieties these days that are sterile and so they won't reproduce and take over. However, that does not mean that they won't be aggressive in your landscape. So take caution just because they're sterile and not producing berries or seeds um, that may spread, that does not mean that this plant will not still be aggressive and be more problematic than what you want. Here's a few pictures of the Lantana Camaro. This is the native picture on the left and on the right, there's a couple pictures of the invasive variety. Um, I will say that again, there are multiple colors that have been coming up in our nurseries that are now sterile varieties. Um, ask questions before purchasing Lantana to make sure that it is a sterile variety you're purchasing.
but they're becoming more and more common. Next, we have our glossy privet or Chinese privet. This is very common in our landscapes. This is a category two invasive. It's a perennial shrub. It does have a beautiful white flower on it, but it is problematic and extremely aggressive. Next, we have Nandina domestica. This is native to China and Japan. Um, Japan, sorry. Introduced as an ornamental here in the United States is 1804. It reproduces by seeds and root fragments. So that's very problematic. There are non-invasive varieties available. Um, the nice thing about this plant in the landscape is it does have a bit of a different texture um, and a different shape to it, unlike some of the other shrubs. But be certain if you're purchasing this that you are getting the non-invasive variety that has sterile um, so it doesn't produce the berries or seeds. Um, otherwise, you'll end up with it all over your landscape and in our natural areas. This is one that the birds really like and they will spread the seeds drastically. Um, next, we have our sword fern, our Boston fern. This lives in woodland areas. It reproduces through spores, uh, through spores. Excuse me, I can't speak this morning. Um, it is extremely aggressive. It makes very, very dense, thick stands of it on the understory brush. Um, there are four different species of ferns that can be very difficult to distinguish between. So if you need help with that, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, there is a native fern that looks very similar to this, but there are a few techniques that you can use to differentiate between them. Never purchase Boston fern. There are native ferns available. Next, we have the Mexican petunia. There are dwarf varieties available as well as sterile varieties. This is very, very popular in the landscape, but I will tell you that this is absolutely one of the most difficult plants to remove from your landscape once it's been established and it gets established very quickly if you plant it there um, and it will continue to spread by rhizomes under the ground as well as by seeds if you don't have the sterile variety. Um, I do have some of this in my landscape and I have two different colors of the sterile varieties. Um, they've been pretty well behaved. I have had very little trouble with it. It's spread to a little bit wider but nothing that would be considered abnormal um, and it certainly hasn't produced any seeds. So um, next we're going to talk just for a minute about some of our category two invasives that we see commonly here in Florida and these are commonly sold in nurseries. Um, we have our coral vine, the wax begonia, paper mulberry, silver thorn, china berry, castor bean, wadelia, and elephant ear. Okay, so first and foremost, coral vine. The one thing I can say about coral vine, yes, it has a beautiful flower. Um, the leaves are heart-shaped that look kind of like the air potato, but they're not. Um, and if you're looking for a vine, we have so many nice native vines that are not invasive and will not um, give you the problems that this will and will not spread into our native ecosystems. So um, we know there's so many vines that are highly desired for butterfly gardens and um, areas where you're trying to attract hummingbirds or other wildlife species, but consider your native alternatives um, instead of planting coral vine. Secondly, wax begonia. This is very popular and comes in many different shapes and sizes. I haven't had any problems with wax begonia myself, but I recommend planting it in a container and not in your landscape. Um, that way it can be managed if it's something that you prefer to keep. Um, it doesn't care for wet areas. You'll often start to see bacterial issues in it, um, but it does like good soils and it will get aggressive if it is happy where it's at. So be careful with wax begonia. There are other species of this as well that are not invasive. Paper mulberry, honestly paper mulberry here in Marion County, um, I can't speak for other parts of the state, but the experiences I've had with the paper mulberry here in Marion County, I can't believe that this isn't a noxious weed. It spreads everywhere. Um, not sure why anybody would want to plant this. It does have a uniquely textured and uniquely shaped leaf, but it's one that we're constantly plucking out of our landscapes here in Marion County. Very aggressive, very, very high seed dispersal rate, 
and it will continue to pop up for years and years. So um, note that on this, again, the unique leaf shape, if you need help identifying it, feel free to send us some pictures. Um, and also those leaves are almost like a thick, fuzzy texture. So they're very different texture than say an oak leaf. Okay, um, our next plant is a silver thorn shrub. This plant is used frequently on some of the horse farms in our areas here in uh, Marion County. It makes a good privacy screening, um, but unfortunately it is a category two invasive. It is extremely aggressive and very difficult to get rid of once it's established, but it was used for many, many years um, as a privacy screening or shield um, in addition to a fence here in our area. So you can see the backside of the leaves have a very um, kind of like a dull silver color, but it's very unique to this plant. So it's pretty easy to identify um, and it is extremely aggressive and hard to get rid of. There's plenty of alternatives out there these days for silver thorn. So it's not one that we would recommend planting. Um, China berry is the next one, and I apologize, this picture is a little blurry. I've got to make sure I get that out of there. Um, China berry is often um, attractive in the landscape. It has very nice flowers, but it is very weak wooded, so it has problems if we have any kind of wind situation. It is a prolific seeding plant. The fruit are also toxic to our pets and other animals, and it's native to Asia and Australia. Here's a great um, picture of China berry. It does have a really attractive little purple flower on it and it flowers um, quite nicely. But look at the number of berries that are on this plant. Um, every single one of those berries, again, just very, very prolific cedar um, and very high germination rates. So one plant can make you know, multiple thousands in a very short period of time. Next, we have castor bean, and I do know some people who still grow castor bean for um, specific medicinal purposes. You can buy castor bean oil at the store. Um, you can see the beans down here have a nice mottled color to them. They're kind of a glossy bean. The plant does have unique characteristics, but it is very aggressive and it's a category two invasive. So um, you can identify this by the palmate leaf shape and the dark red um, under it. So um, this plant has been around for a long time, but we do not recommend it in our landscapes. Next we have Wedelia. This is similar to your dune sunflower or dune daisy, um, but this plant will get out of control very quickly. Although it has a very pretty yellow flower, consider alternatives such as the dune daisy or dune sunflower. Um, or even black-eyed Susans. They will also take over a large area, but they're native and not invasive. Um, this plant will start popping up in er other areas of your landscape and possibly even at your neighbor's house where you don't want it. And then of course it ends up in our natural areas. So stay away from Wedelia. Lastly, we have our elephant ear. Um, elephant ears are one that is problematic. I happen to have one of my colleagues who bought a home that had elephant ears in the backyard and they cut them down, they mowed them down, they tried to spray them with glyphosate and many other um, different removal processes. And here six years later, the elephant ears are still trying to come back. There are other species that are not elephant ears but have a similar texture and shape without quite as uh, much destruction behind them. So if you have elephant ears in your landscape, we do recommend removing them. Um, other options might include philodendron or taro. Um, there's a ton of different species that would fit this category as far as the texture goes if that's what you're looking to achieve. Um, if you need information on that, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can try to help you with some alternatives um, for elephant ears. Um, there's many other invasive species out there besides the ones we just mentioned. These are just very common. Um, one that I didn't get into because it's a bit of a different class is Kogan grass here in Marion County is very prevalent and there's many others. So if you have questions on invasive species, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can help you with specific um, instruction on removal, but our basic con control methods are um, mechanical control. So mowing, cutting down, digging up, all of those are the most effective methods. However, with invasive species, we also 
recommend biological controls and chemical controls and often some combination of all three of these. I will say if you're going to use chemical controls, um, obviously triclopyr and glyphosate are two of the most common. Always, always, always read the label and follow the instructions um, including all safety precautions and the um, personal protective equipment that's recommended by the label to keep yourself safe. Um, and this varies between individual products. So don't think that just because you've been using one product that the other will be the same. Chemical applications can include foiler sprays, so spraying on top of the leaves. Cut stump, so you cut it and after a fresh cut, you spray directly to that top stump. Um, basil bark applications or hack and squirt is the unofficial term for it. Um, all of these will help cut back on our invasive species. And like I said, usually it does take some combination of mechanical, biological, and chemical control methods to be able to control um, our invasive species here. But we hope you'll help us and keep working to eradicate these. Um, as we spoke of before, our suggested resources, and I believe I've actually um, got all these listed on here correctly. I spoke wrong earlier. Um, the IFAS assessment is assessment.ifas.ufl.edu, not vice versa. Um, again, that's assessment.ifas.ufl.edu, and that is our most up-to-date resource here for the University of Florida. We've put a lot of time and energy and research into that. Um, often those plants have been researched for at least 10 years prior to making it on this list. Um, you've got plants.ifas.ufl.edu, um, of course our EDIS website, and then as I mentioned, the FLEPSI list, so fleppc.org. So all of these are fantastic resources, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you with your invasive species questions or concerns. Um, thanks so much for attending today. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and um, we will have another program next Friday.